The first talk will be given by uh, Dr. Rani Nelkan. He's the head of research in Outbrain. He has a PhD in computer science from the Technion. The stage is zero. Okay, thank you so much, uh, both for inviting me to speak here and uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about online profiling of uh, content consumption, but first I want to start with a question. You know, what's the most important topic in today's Israeli high-tech? Anyone know? So, of course, it's lunch, or food in general, as we can see, you know, in this break. Uh, you know, in any office you go, in any high-tech office, even first thing in the morning, all people talk about, okay, where are we going for lunch? We're going to this place, that place, Tenbi, Sibus, whatever. Uh, and people have very uh, strict dietary preferences, right? Everyone is either vegetarian or they're paleo, and there's no, no one in the middle. Uh, now imagine that you had to figure out what people want to eat, uh, but you're not allowed to ask them. So you just have to look over their plates and from that try and figure out what their preferences are. So that's similar to the situation I'm going to talk to you about today, but of course not talking about food, but about uh, news articles. So let me give a brief intro about what Outbrain is. Outbrain is uh, a leading content provider um, content recommendation provider. So this is a, a page from CNN and typically when you scroll down to the bottom of the page you'll see our recommendations and these are either internal recommendations from the same publisher or external recommendations that go to other publishers or brands. Um, this is done uh, on a large set of publishers and blogs and news sites and these are some of the most familiar names in the publishing industry. You'll recognize a lot of names here. Um, and the scale is huge. So it's over 560 million monthly uniques. The number of page views per month is over 25 billion. And the number of recommendations that we actually serve is one order of magnitude greater than that. So it's, it's a huge, huge scale. In terms of our uh, vision and where we want to be in the space, we really care about the end user. So there's three constituencies in this recommendation game. There's the publisher, there's the external publisher we send people to, and there's the reader, and we really care about the reader. So our lighthouse is to help people discover content that they can trust to be interesting, relevant, and timely for them. And the most natural way to do that is through personalization. And personalization, there are two main methods of doing personalization. One is based on understanding the content, um, and the other is based on collaborative filtering, and of course there are hybrid approaches that use both. In this talk, I'll talk only about the first part, about content-based personalization. Um, in order to do personalization, we have to really figure out what people are interested in, and this means first extracting features from the items that they consume. Uh, so if you imagine my um, metaphor of, of food, you have to look at, into their plates and see what they're eating and try to extract from that what, they, um, what type of food it is. Then we have to construct user profiles and that, that has to be done in an incremental fashion and I'll talk more about that. And finally, um, matching the content with the user profile. And my focus today is going to be on the first two points. Um, now, the fact that we have to construct profiles is very straightforward, and you know, that's something that's very well known in the literature. But there are several interesting challenges that are due to the domain that we're dealing with. So first of all, because these are uh, news items, um, we have to somehow understand the content. So it's not enough for us to look at the individual items. Like, for instance, in movie recommendations, movies change very infrequently. The same movie might still be relevant after a few days, after a few years even, after a few decades in some extreme cases. But for news, since it updates very frequently, uh, by the time we learn enough statistics about a single news item, that news item is no longer of relevance to anyone. 
Uh, so we really have to understand something more abstract about the content. Updates are done in an online fashion. So every time a user comes in to, to places we're installed on, we get an update of that, and we have to update their profile. Interests are dynamic. So the fact that a user was interested in some topic a month ago does not mean that they're still interested in it today. And finally, due to those huge scale numbers that I talked about, this affects a lot of our algorithms, and I'll talk about that. Um, this is uh, the, the process where a user comes in on every place we're installed. We see them interacting with the different uh, news items or um, articles. It could be videos. It can be uh, images. And there are several different interaction types, and we log all that. Once we, we see which items they interact with, we need to extract meaningful features from them. And these are some of the most interesting features that we use. So first of all, there's all the metadata about the, uh, about the articles. And the most obvious one is the site it's on. So what we see very broadly is that people have a lot of affinity to specific publishers. They like to get their news from a specific publisher, even though different variants of the same story may appear all over the place. People are loyal to a site. Uh, more interestingly, we use several NLP features, which I'll talk about in a second, to try and figure out what the uh, content is about. And these include categories, topics, and entities. And finally, we take Cartesian products of these. So for example, uh, if you think about categories, categories can be um, you know, celebrities, can be uh, finance, can be war, different types of um, categories that people write about. But people may have preferences of getting those categories from different publishers. So maybe you want to get your uh, financial news from The Marker, but you want to read your celebrity news on Ynet. Um, so moving on to talking about NLP, uh, really it's important for us to understand what an article is about. So, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with NLP, you can think of uh, the classical approach is just to look at the words. And that's very relevant for search. You know, you can search by keywords. There are various um, uh, weighing schemes, but the basic approach is just to use the words. And it's called bag of words because we typically don't care about the order, we don't care about the syntax, we just care about the individual words. This is uh, insufficient in this case. So it's not enough for us to see what words are in the articles that people read. We really want something that's lower dimensional. And uh, the sense of dimensionality here is if you think of each word as a dimension, you can think of a document as a vector in that high dimensional space. So we need ways of reducing the dimensionality. And I'll talk about three different ways that we do this. One is categories. Categories just means that we uh, reduce the problem to supervised classification. So we define a set of categories. Um, and then we train a classifier that can distinguish between these categories. So categories can be uh, you know, different types of sports, different types of entertainment, finance, the, those kinds of things. And that works really well. And it, allows us to reduce the space. So instead of learning that a user was interested in a specific article uh, about last night's game, we know that they're interested more generally in basketball. Um, going beyond just categories, we also use topics. And there's a, a very wide literature on using topic modeling for understanding texts. And topic modeling. Uh, instead of trying to impose the supervised classif classification approach where you say, you know, these are the categories, now let's find which of these um, each document belongs to, topics are a way of using more sophisticated probabilistic graphical models to learn the distribution from the text itself. So you just feed it, feed these methods large amounts of uh, training data. Uh, you mess with a lot of hyperparameters, and then you get things like this. So, and this is just an illustration, but the hope is that you can find uh, coherent clusters of words where the 
size of the word in this graphic is the proxy for the probability of the word. Um, so you might have a music topic, a cyber topic, etc. And finally, a third um, type of reduced dimensionality we use for NLP is identifying the named entities. So we know that an article is not just about politics, but it's uh, specifically about Donald Trump, say. And uh, we add another layer there is finding the relevant ones. So we don't care about all the entities. We care just about the most important ones. OK, once we have those features, we have to somehow aggregate them into a profile. And um, there are uh, three requirements that we care about. So first of all, it has to be incremental. So we can't stop the world and look at the user's entire history up till now. We have to, each time we see a new article, we have to add it to the aggregation. It has to be dynamic in the sense that it can change over time. And uh, since we're using this huge scale, complexity, space complexity has to be low. And the natural solution for this is uh, using streaming algorithms. And there's a two variants, two main variants for streaming algorithms. There's uh, types of lossy counting, right, where you collect, uh, you count the items, but you're allowed to selectively forget or decay some of the previous items. And the other approach is sketching. And we've uh, experimented with both. And in sketching, uh, you use compact hashing schemes. So hashing reduces the size that you, you store. The reason this is so important is, especially if you think about the Cartesian uh, products, you can get uh, many thousands of features. And it's impractical to store all of those for every user. Um, so to choose between both the parameterizations for the feature extraction and between the algorithms and the parameterizations of the algorithms, we have to do some sort of offline evaluation. And the natural way to do that is to simulate what we do in real time. So, you know, we look at the user, we hide some of their uh, future data. So we look at actual traces and we say, okay, until this point, let's incrementally build a profile and try to predict these. The problem with this um, approach is that it's, um, th there are two main problems. The first one is that while we see all the positive interactions of the users with the items, we don't see the negative interactions. So we know that they may not have clicked on something, but we don't know whether they didn't click on it just because they didn't see it or just because you know, something else was more interesting. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. The other main problem is that there is very heavy bias. And this is a classical problem in recommendation systems. You know, how do you deal with popularity bias? So a lot of the traffic that we see that people go to articles, they, they tend to go to the articles that appear on the home page. And that reflects mostly the publisher's editorial staff, what they prefer to sh put on the home page. So we don't want to just reverse engineer what the editors do. We really want to know what a person was interested in. To handle both of these issues, we use um, a different approach for offline prediction. So instead of predicting for each user what they might be interested in, we pair off pairs of users. So we pick two users. For each user, we look at the items that they actually saw that are from the hidden set, from the development set. And we see whether the model would predict that each user would prefer to see the item that they actually saw or would predict the other one. So this corrects for the bias. So a simple approach, say, that would just predict the most popular thing would obviously fail on, on this kind of test. And we run this at scale using Spark you know, on large amounts of users and items. And that allows us to optimize both the choice of the features and the choice of the algorithms. To conclude, so I really um, talked about some of the challenges we have in content-based profiling. Uh, we find that it's extremely powerful, so we sometimes are able to see really strong preferences of users. I talked about some of the interesting algorithmic challenges that come both in trying to understand the content and in dealing with the dynamic and online aspects of things. Um, there's a whole other part of this work, which is about how do you implement all this 
you know, using scalable software architecture that can handle all of this at, uh, at these large scales. Okay, so I think I'm just on time. <laughs> okay. We have time for a couple of questions. Anyone? Go ahead. The question is how do we identify the user? So we have a cookie. So we don't know, you know, we don't know who the user is actually. <coughs> Uh, you know, so sometimes when I tell friends this is, uh, you know, we're, we're spying on people, you know, they get very nervous, but we tell them it's all anonymous, right? So we identify that cookie ID, blah, 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 is interested in these particular topics. We don't know that it's uh, you. But of course, there's problems with cookies, there's mobile, there's, there's a whole other set of questions mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, let me repeat the question. The question is, if I understand correctly, is is there a minimal amount of users for which a, for a site for the recommendations within the site to be effective? Um, so no, we we have several layers of fallback. So even if a site has very low interaction, if it's just you know your own personal blog, we can still recommend things that are related contextually as opposed to behaviorally, so we still get some sort of uh, information there. Uh, but most of our focus is on, on these large publishers where there's no lack of users, and there we get a lot of uh, information. But my focus here is really about understanding the individual user. So a qu good question there is, you know, at what point, let's say we only see these, this user, it's a cold start user, we just saw him for the first time, how can we recommend something interesting for them? And there, what we're trying to do is try and see, you know, even from a small amount of data, whether that data is already, uh, can push us in some direction. So if you see um, only a small amount of articles, if it's just the usual politics, celebrity stuff, then, then we don't know enough about you. But if it's something very niche, then maybe we can tell something more interesting about you. Thank you very much. Okay.